my parents are immigrants, um, you know, not a silver spoon kid, but I did grow up normal. I mean, I, I was born and raised here in Cleveland, Ohio. I live in a suburb of Cleveland still to this day. Um, you know, I live a normal middle class life, you know, and that's how I was raised. So, you know, I wasn't, uh, I went to a public school, public high school, you know, I had friends from all across the spectrum, all socioeconomic levels. You know, I was friends with kids that lived in, you know, apartments. I was kids, I was friends with kids that lived in, you know, 4,000 square foot McMansions, right? So all across the board. Uh, I think my lifestyle is anyone that resonates with kind of like a just regular uh, Midwest childhood, you know, East Coast childhood. Um, you know, we played outside from 9 a.m. till 9 p.m., came home when it was dark. But um, I always had some entrepreneurial spirit in terms of, you know, wanting to sell things. So I'm 35. I'm in my mid-30s. But I was selling Pokemon cards before, you know, inter the Internet. It feels like the Internet <laughs> even existed. But, you know, sold Pokemon cards, sold mixtapes, did that whole thing. And then um, always had a passion for finance. You know, you, you grow up a little bit. You start to mature. And then when I was uh, 17, 18 years old, you start looking at, hey, what do rich people do? Well, they invest in stocks, right? So I wanted to um, teach people about that. I was always passionate about personal finance and also teaching people. So um, went to the University of Akron, graduated with a finance degree, got my bachelor's in finance, and I graduated into the 2010 Great Recession. So basically the aftermath of the great financial crisis. Uh, unemployment was 9%, 10%. Um, I have a finance degree, and I ended up selling cars. So uh, nothing wrong with selling cars, <laughs> but I could have done that without you know, a high school diploma. So um, my point is, you never know what life will hand you, but that was actually a blessing in disguise because ultimately, uh, I think sales is probably one of the most important skills you can learn. You're always selling something, whether it's yourself in a job interview, whether it's a product, whether it's, you know, whatever, you know, you always have to be selling something, whether you know it or not. So that was actually a big wake up call. And it was also um, B2C, so business to consumer. Um, you know, the consumer thinks if your lips are moving, you're lying. So you have to learn how to kind of build trust with people. Um, and then from there, went into work with uh, a couple of startups here in Cleveland. Uh, we ended up selling one. I had a little bit of equity, not enough to have, you know, my name on a building or a helicopter or anything like that. You know, very, very small exit. And then um, ended up working in commercial real estate for many years. So um, from there, went from publicly traded uh, company called Marcus and Milchap, commercial uh, markets, or excuse me, capital markets. It was commercial mortgage lending. Um, so instead of a residential mortgage, we were working on commercial properties, you know, million bucks to maybe 30, 40 million, if I recall correctly. And then all in the meantime, I never really scratched the itch of being that personal financial advisor that I wanted to be. Um, so I took a DSLR camera, went on Craigslist, bought a big whiteboard, um, a dry erase board and started teaching finance on YouTube in November of 2017, um, all while working, you know, the W-2 finance job. So um, in 2019, ironically enough, to wrap this all together, um, the video that actually blew up my channel was uh, a car dealership video talking about the economics of a car sale and how certain marketing tactics, you know, were okay. Some aren't. That's, that day is dead now. You don't really sell cars like that anymore with the advent of the internet. Um, but ironically enough, that video has like 8 million views. Um, it allowed me to quit my job. I was working at um, a publicly traded bank here in Cleveland, and that was in 2019. And I've been on YouTube full-time ever since. And just to kind of take a step back through your story and break it down a little bit, like what made you go from being more focused in like financial markets, maybe stocks, like that side of finance to getting into the more real estate side of the house? Like what was it that led you to that point? Yeah, that's a good question. So I feel like with a finance degree for the younger people listening or the people that maybe aren't established in a career just yet, um, you can go, you can go in so many different ways. Um, you know, being a financial advisor, that's essentially in sales. You know, you're just selling insurance products for the most part, you can go into portfolio management, you can be an analyst, you can work in the back office, you can work in the front office. Um, back office, typically more analytical. Front office, you're on the sales side, you're a banker, you're you know a lender, whatever. So um, ultimately, the reason I went the commercial real estate route was because there was a boutique development firm. There are real estate developers here in Northeast Ohio and Cleveland. Um, the owner was my boss, mentor, partner. You know, We built duplexes together, we did a lot of stuff together. Um, probably one of the best people I probably could have met because his similar his story was similar to mine. He grew up on a farm in Doylestown, Ohio, like literally a farm, got his series, um, you know, 63, 65, all that stuff at the age of like 18, 19, literally. 
um, and went from being a farmer to landing, you know, his own helicopters on top of office buildings in Cleveland, right? So um, the way that it's hard to explain. So like, this was such a unique opportunity that it was almost like working at a startup because I was working on like land development deals. I was, I was talking to cities, getting approvals, zoning, all this stuff. And you see uh, new construction from, you know, literally an idea to acquiring the land all the way through completion to renting it, owning it, operating it. So it wasn't necessarily a path that I consciously chose, but it came up um, after we sold the startup here in Cleveland. They said, hey, we're looking for a young guy, finance guy, entrepreneurial, met with them and ended up working with them for about three or four years. And then after that, went into the lending side. And then after that, uh, YouTube. So um, not your typical answer, but it was kind of like, I don't want to say luck or fate, but it was probably one of the best things that could have happened to me because your your net worth really is, or your network really is your net worth. Like you get in circles with people that you have no business, you know, talking to similar to how, you know, if you grow a YouTube channel or, you know, your podcast, your financial independence show, you know, you're meeting authors, entrepreneurs, you know, people with huge followings. And it's like, you know, I would have never been able to do this if I just would have had that limiting self-belief, if that makes sense. That makes absolute sense. Yeah, that's one of the reasons Justin and I like doing this so much is because we have a platform to meet so many amazing people. And I mean, the glass ceilings that I've probably opposed to myself have just been shattered for sure. meeting people who are like retiring at you know, 27 and 28 <laughs> and building $10 million net worths by mid their mid thirties. It's crazy. But going back to your story. So as you're, I'm guessing, getting these high paying jobs, I was in commercial real estate as well. It was pretty well paid. What are you doing in the personal finance side of things? Like, are you living super frugally? Are you just investing like a ton of that to ultimately reach this goal of financial independence? Did you even know that this financial independence was a thing? Could you just talk us through the personal side of things real quick? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think that everything that I've taught on my YouTube channel um, and the reason why people still watch me, you know, five, six years later um, is just because I've practiced what I've preached. So I've always been a student or a fan of, you know, personal finance and then also just investing in general. So the way that I look at things is in the beginning, it's almost, you know, people make fun of Dave Ramsey, but I think his um, get out of debt stuff is really good. But then you can kind of graduate from that later on as you build uh, more wealth or a bigger nest egg. Um, but I think he's absolutely right and hits the nail on the head where I look at personal finance as like a foundation of building a skyscraper, skyscraper, excuse me. So I feel like if you're building a skyscraper on a ton of debt, and I'm not talking like, you know, you're house hacking, you know, you're investing in stocks, you're doing all this stuff. But I feel like if you're building it on consumer debt, that's just a house of cards ready to tumble, right? It's very risky. Debt is just risk, right? So um, what I did was I eliminated student loans as quickly as I could, um, never really had a credit card balance. Um, I, that's instilled from me from my, you know, immigrant parents, you know, old school Slavic mentality, like that is bad. No one has debt, you know, cash and cars, all that kind of stuff or cars and cash, excuse me. So I never really had that debt issue after I paid off the student loans. And then when I got married, my wife is a nurse. We paid off her undergrad and we've always kind of been debt free. So to answer your question, you kind of graduate into the next step of like, okay, let me use this bucket system. So the way that I save money is I have a house fund, a car fund, savings and emergency fund, an investing fund, and then maybe like a travel fund, for example. So I know exactly what I can afford at any given time. So whatever's in that bucket, you know, if I have a hundred bucks in there, I know I can't go to Maui, you know, but if I have $10,000 in there, oh, okay, I can afford something, right? So it's kind of just common sense. So I like the bucket system from the savings standpoint. Um, and then also from an investment standpoint, I was always the guy that took advantage of the Roth IRA, not necessarily the 401k, you know, which some people may or may not agree with. That's fine. Um, but the Roth IRA, when my income was able to be invested in that, I know you can do backdoors and all that stuff, but just for the sake of simplicity, uh, I did Roth IRA because you can always take it out. You can always take out what, you know, your, your contribution was. It was almost like a glorified savings account. And then from there, um, I've always been a big proponent of real estate. Um, and then also just looking at your portfolio as a pie. So like, hey, you know, here's a pizza. Here's my net worth. How big is the slice of stocks? How big is the slice of bonds? How big is the slice of real estate? You know, so on and so forth. So that's kind of how I've always managed my money. And to be honest with you, that works when you have zero dollars to your name. It works when you have a lot of money to your name. <laughs> because, you know, if you set weights to each asset class of that pie or each slice of that pie, you always know if you're out of whack or not if you need to contribute more or, you know, kind of slow down. So that's kind of how I manage my personal finances. 
And what was it like as far as, you know, think about savings rates, how much you were spending um, as you started to make more money, as you started to make more and more money, did you see like that lifestyle creep or have you always been pretty comfortable kind of staying at a, a similar type lifestyle? Yeah, it's it's always it's all proportional in my mind. So um, the one thing we can talk about, you know, Twitter and you know, personal finance Twitter and all that <laughs> in a minute, but um, it's all proportional. So if you're making you know a million dollars a year, like yeah, dude, go out to eat, go do whatever you want, right? Um, if you're making ten thousand dollars a year, obviously you should act your wage, you know, similar to what Dave Ramsey says. So um, for to answer your question, Justin, it's all proportional. So like. You know, if I'm making, if I'm a new, new grad and I'm making 55 grand a year, you know, am I going to go buy, you know, a $4,000 sauna? Probably not. Right. Um, if I'm making, if I'm mid level career making $250,000 a year and I enjoy a sauna, like I'm going to buy a $4,000 sauna, <laughs> you know, like to me, that's not unreasonable. So everything within reason, but I will say is here's my style of budgeting. It's understanding exactly how much money you make. Um, and then having a good, good idea, not every penny, not 7,000, uh, sheet, you know, Excel spreadsheet with 30,000 cells, and you know, when you farted at 6 1 PM on a Saturday, <laughs> like to me, that's, that's, that's creating another job for yourself. What I, what I like to do is understand exactly how much I bring in a month versus what my relative spending is. And then just kind of break it down that way. There's like a 50, 30, 20 rule. Um, but that gets kind of hard to track, especially if your income's all over the place. But if you're not like a self, uh, if you're not a um, commissioned salesperson, self-employed, you know, business owner, your income is up and down like a roller coaster. If your stuff is steady, I think that's a good way to do it. If your income is kind of all over the place, um, I'm a big fan of having at least, you know, six to 12 months of emergency fund. Some people will say that's too much, but in my opinion, you know, you got to look at your, um, if you're if you're straight commission sales, you got to look at your income like a professional athlete who may not have a guaranteed contract, right? You know, you could go through a recession, could go through a drought. Um, if you're a YouTuber, you don't know what your income is going to be. If you're a business owner, you may go through uh, cyclical, you know, ups and downs. You always got to save for a rainy day. So I think six to twelve months is reasonable for business owners slash um, straight commission salespeople. So two part question, digging into some terms you talked about there. First, can you just quickly define, we don't have to hammer it, but the 50, 30, 20 rule. And then also, could you talk about how you have gone about figuring out the percentages for your pie? Yeah, good question. So I have a video on the 50, 30, 20 rule. It's actually one of the most popular videos on my channel. I um, watched I it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I won't go down into, you know, breaking that up completely, but it's basically like, you know, living, then you have, you know, um, expenses and then, you know, wants, you know, so like wants, needs, and then what you need to maintain your life. So the way that I manage mine is, um, I don't necessarily break it down by percentage because I'm not a big, uh, budgeting guy. I'm a big spreadsheet guy. I made a living in Excel, but, um, not necessarily to the tune of like tracking every single expense. What I do use is I do use personal capital. It's now empower, um, personal capital, if you guys haven't heard about it, I'm not sponsored by them at all. It's just something I personally use. It's a great way to track your net worth and link all your bank accounts so you can kind of see exactly where your net worth is at and see kind of where you're overweight or underweight. And then you can link those credit cards or whatever you use to purchase things and it'll kind of break it down by category. So I, I like to use it that way. But for me, sorry, sorry uh, real quick, Cody and Justin, but for me, um, paying yourself first is more important than budgeting. Um, that's why for me, it's like, okay, I know I have, let's just use easy numbers. I have $10,000 a month coming in. I know my expenses as a family are, let's say five a month or whatever. Um, so that leaves me with five to play with that five is automatically going somewhere, whether it's in those savings buckets or whether it's investing, um, you know, you want to have every dollar, every penny kind of working for you. You don't want to just have it idle unless you're saving for something, you know, it's a different story, but yeah, paying yourself first is definitely the most important, which I'm sure your audience already knows. Well, another great thing you can do with personal capital is, you know, looking at that overall allocation. And you were talking about that earlier, like your asset allocation, how much in real estate, how much in stocks, how much in bonds. Is there any kind of thing there that you'd like to educate the audience on, like your thoughts around what those weights maybe should be? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that depends on a few things. It depends on your risk tolerance and it depends on kind of where you're at in life. So this conversation is different for a 90 year old versus, you know, a 17 year old, right? Um, so I think that, um, my weights personally, um, I could pull up my spreadsheet. So my percentages, uh, again, I'm 35. I have a wife, a kid, another kid on the way. 
Um, right now, given like the macroeconomic environment, I, I'm pretty confident we're going into recession. Uh, we're actually in a recession right now, but I don't know if they changed the definition for the <laughs> 17th time this year. But <laughs> yeah. um, cash for me is 15%. This may sound way too high, but this is the way I look at cash. Uh, so again, look, thinking of it like a pizza slice, 15% of the pizza should be cash. So if you have 100 grand, 15 should be cash. Um, why do I look at it this way? So cash is not only uh, defense, like a savings and emergency fund, which most people think when they think of cash. It's also dry powder for recessionary events, you know, buying opportunities, investment opportunities, things like that. So, you know, God forbid the little old lady down the street passes away, you know, it's a great deal. You can offer cash to her family, buy the house or whatever, you know, it's just little buying opportunities. The stock goes down 20% that you're a, you know, long-term holder of or an ETF or an index, index fund, you know, buy the dip, that kind of a thing. So 15% cash, uh, 35% equities, you know, stocks, ETFs, index funds, individual stocks, whatever floats your boat. Um, so 35 grand in our $100,000 example. Uh, bonds right now, I have it at zero. I do own a little bit of d and It's an ETF from uh, Vanguard. But just the macro environment in terms of like interest rates, bonds have been getting crushed. Like the traditional 60-40 portfolio has been getting crushed this year. So I have nothing in bonds, relatively speaking. Uh, real estate for me is 33%, a uh, third of your net worth. Um, precious metals, a little bit, maybe like 2%. Uh, Bitcoin, specifically Bitcoin. When people say crypto. Crypto, in my opinion, is sound money. 99% of it is garbage as a sound money. I'm not saying it has no utility. I'm saying as a sound hard money, um, most of crypto is just a Ponzi scheme. But for me, Bitcoin is probably the hardest money ever created um, by humans. So for me, that's 15%. If I didn't have a family, it'd probably be a lot more. <laughs> and you can adjust <laughs> these accordingly. So it, it doesn't matter. But then, then you have other things like, you know, cars, material items, other, you know, those things go into your net worth, but it's not necessarily an investment. So um, basically 15 cash, 35 stocks, 33 real estate, 2% precious metals, 15% Bitcoin. You can adjust those accordingly. Um, now what's popular is people are saving up to buy small, medium businesses. You know, a lot of boomers are retiring. There's a lot of wealth uh, generation there. Um, so that could be a life-changing event, but you know, that's also an alternative investment. So for the more traditional stuff, that's my breakdown, but again, it changes by age. So, and since we have an audience that a lot of people are gunning for early retirement, is there anything that you would tweak to that specific allocation? Like if someone were to say, Hey, Marco, I'm 22 years old and I want to be completely done by the time I'm 35. Like what's a, what's a pot, um, what's a pie for that person look like? Yeah, so that's the age-old debate of net worth versus cash flow, right? Mm, yep. So for me, I think you can kill two birds with one stone by house hacking if you're young. Um, I know this doesn't answer the exact age question, but let's just pretend you're young. Um, if I could do it all, all over again, I would just buy a duplex or a fourplex. I wouldn't necessarily go the 3.5% down route. Um, I would try and save up more, you know, 15 to 20, um, or at least get rid of, you know, any fees that come so along with that, like PMI, for example. But I would house hack because not only are you potentially living for free, you could actually be making a little bit of cash flow. And then when you move out, you know, say you get married or you get your first big boy, big girl job, and you move out. Now you have two tenants, right? So that's a cash flow play and a net worth building play. If you're looking at strictly cash flow, um, it just depends, man. You need, you need a big shovel, which means you need a lot of income to get to that point, um, which I know uh, you have, Cody. Um, but basically, you know, say you have some sort of an exit, you know, say you sell a business, say you have some liquidation or liquidity event where you get a lot of money. Um, there's a couple ways you can go about it. For me, I personally have my SEP IRA is just a dividend portfolio. Um, it's averaging, I want to say like three and a half percent, which is not high, but at the end of the day, you don't really want to chase yield because you're giving up quality of company or quality of the backing of that stock, if you will, in my opinion. Um, but you can do a couple different things. You know, real estate is a good cash flow play. I don't think it has been for the past, since 20, I don't know, 16, 17-ish, just because with low interest rates, asset prices increased, it's harder to find deals. That's all I'm trying to say. But you could really, really reach financial independence by buying a cash flowing business. Um, so depending on the knowledge of financial terms, let's call it EBITDA. So earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. You know, you can buy, you know, a million dollar EBITDA business um, or let's just say $500,000 EBITDA business. You can get an SBA loan, you acquire this business and then you just bought an asset for life with, you know, high leverage through the SBA. Um, I'm over, over, over simplifying this, but I'm saying if you're really concerned about cash flow, 
Um, I think buying a business destroys everything, but that's active income. You're obviously owning a business. Um, but in terms of like traditional assets, more passive assets, um, I've always been a fan of real estate because it preserves wealth. It at least keeps up with inflation with the opportunity for cash flow. Um, so I'm in the Midwest. I'm in Cleveland. Um, I don't really consider Cleveland Midwest, but let's just say Columbus, Ohio, Midwest. You know, houses aren't that expensive and you can get a nice cash flowing tenant in there as opposed to like the coasts where, you know, the price of the house is expensive. You're probably not going to make any cash flow, but you have a bigger um, equity upside. So I think uh, real estate is good because it preserves wealth and there's a cash component and then also dividend stocks. Um, some people will argue against that. They just say, they say, hey, why not invest in VTI? You know, let uh, total stock market fund, you know, let it do its thing over 10, 20, 30 years uh, instead of dividends where you're just getting paid out the dividend and, uh, and simultaneously the share price is going down complementary to the dividend being paid out, right? So there's a bunch of different schools of thought but in my opinion, I, I like dividend stocks because it's something where you're owning kind of a little rental property or a pump jack, you know, if you, if you want to use the oil analogy. And you don't necessarily care what the stock price is doing as long as that rental property um, is kind of producing a cash flow. So you don't care about the price of the home as long as you have a tenant in there paying you money. So um, I know this was super, super, super long-winded, but if it was me, if you had a big, big chunk of change to work with, I would look at acquiring a business if you want to be an entrepreneur through acquisition, um, real estate, because it preserves wealth historically. Um, and we're printing, you know, a metric <laughs> crap ton of money. So our money's <laughs> being debased every day. Um, and then finally, I would look into something way more passive like dividend stocks if you have the means, if you have that big shovel. So I know this was a super long answer. No, it's good. Great information. And I know a lot of times, uh, me and Cody, because, you know, we've, we've been in this space for a while and sometimes you kind of forget what maybe some of the things the broader public is struggling with, but with you having such a large YouTube channel, I'm sure you're seeing tons of stuff in comments and you're having a lot more interaction with the broader public, like not just people who are, you know, tuning into a specific, uh, you know, finance show. Yeah. Um, kind of curious, like if there's things you've picked up on that, uh, you see as common themes that people are struggling with either understanding or just performing in, in, the, in their personal finance space? Yeah, that's a great question. I think most people um, in general, they don't have these financial literacy conversations to begin with. Um, so at the dealership that I sold cars uh, at, it's one of the biggest dealerships in the Cleveland area and that, that city, that, that suburb, it's where all you know, Browns, Cleveland Browns players live, uh, Cavs players live, you know, a lot of professional athletes. And I'm looking through these dudes' glove boxes to get the registration information if they're trading in a car. They, NFL players had uncashed checks in their glove box. Can't, I can't make this up. Okay. So you're making, you know, six-figure checks every Sunday, you know, not less, less. These weren't like, you know, stars, but, you know, five-figure checks sitting in your glove box. Like, what are you doing, dude? What are you doing, <laughs> you know? So that's just the microcosm. That's a professional athlete where they have financial advisors. They have all that stuff. So imagine, you know, the regular Joe who, you know, who's – putting cash in his mattress, right? Who just doesn't know. So my point is, is that here's, here's my macro thesis. I think with inflation and with everything that's been going on with, you know, all the trillions of dollars printed and just introducing that money into the system slowly, um, most of that money sits at commercial banks. That money that was printed during COVID has not been introduced into the system. Um, but anyway, my point is, is that I think the middle class is getting crushed by inflation. Um, so more people are tuning into the side hustle stuff right now, as opposed to the traditional, Hey, let's, let's, let's invest your money. They don't have money to invest. <laughs> right. So my point, and I don't say that, like, uh, I know I'm laughing, but that's not like a comical statement. My point is, is that, um, I think people are getting crushed right now. So they're going to things like we talked about before we started recording, like the gig economy, side hustles, you know, all that stuff. And that's fine. That's okay. People need to, they need to earn an income. However, um, I think that we need to fundamentally understand more what money is, why we're dedicating our entire life energy for it, and to deploy it properly as opposed to just kind of aimlessly going about life, right? So like, um, and here's the other thing with personal finance, some people say like, hey, you know, be super frugal. I agree with that when you have to be. But in the States, I feel like people are kind of losing that balance between like, Hey, I need to side hustle, but I haven't played with my kid in three days. You know what I mean? There needs to be that balance or I haven't hung out with my buddy or got a beer at the bar, you know, with my friend in, you know, three months, right? I haven't seen my friend. So there needs to be that balance as well. And I feel like that balance is getting harder to achieve, if that makes sense. So to answer, to answer your question, Justin, I feel like 
more people are struggling with day-to-day stuff and they're kind of getting onto that credit card hamster wheel um, or that debt-driven hamster wheel um, as opposed to being able to kind of enjoy just a regular lifestyle. I'm not talking about taking trips to Maui or, you know, uh, Maldives or anything like that. I'm just saying like a regular lifestyle. So I think it affects mental health. I think it affects financial health. I think it affects relationships. I think it's just a, a bigger systemic issue than just, you know, you know, uh, $3 in, $2 out, you know, that kind of a thing. So I do want to double click on why some gig economy jobs suck. I know you mentioned before we hit go, you're like, I'm not a fan of these certain gig economy jobs. Not all side hustles were created equal. So could we just talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. So I went down this rabbit hole. Um, I'm a big consumer of YouTube. Like I make a living from YouTube, but I also enjoy it. Um, so I go down all these different side hustle routes. You know, I watch these kids that are building and I enjoy entrepreneurship too. So I'm excited for these people. Um, they're building their lawn service business. Some guys door dashing for a Tesla, you know, these guys are delivering food on an electric bike, you know, all that stuff. I just see like, oh, okay, this is cool. But whenever they disclose their numbers, if you're using, if you're doing like DoorDash, for example, and you're using your personal vehicle, like, why do you think the IRS deduction rate is like 65 cents a mile now? There's a reason for that, or it could be 57 and a half. I don't know what the most recent one is. I'm pretty sure it's 65 cents a mile. But um, why do you think that is? It's because when you account for depreciation, uh, maintenance, you know, tires, engine, transmission, oil, all that stuff, and the wear and tear of your car, you're not making any money. You're just being an indentured servant to DoorDash or an indentured servant to Uber, right? So those things, in my opinion, they don't make sense if you're using your own personal vehicle. There's ways to get around that. So if you have like an electric bike, you know, electric uh, scooter, whatever, and you can do that, that's great. Knock yourself out. But if you're destroying your own property, um, depreciation, maintenance, you know, gas, all that stuff, you're not making any money at the end of the day. And I think a lot of people who aren't really, I don't want to say business savvy, but they don't break down all their expenses, you know, insurance, all that stuff. You're not making any money at the end of the day. You're making below minimum wage. Sorry. I thought there's going to be like a, I thought you might have like a longer list. Um, <clears throat> what about some of the side hustles that you've seen people have that maybe jump out to you as things that you are a fan of? Yeah. So I don't know if I would, so I'm a big fan of side hustles with the potential for a full-time income. So something that you're working towards, something that you're building equity in, whether it's your own business, whether it's um, something that's going to bring you more money down the road. I'm a big fan of uh, asymmetric bets. So you start small. Hey, if I do want to start cutting grass, I can start with a $200 Honda, but if I keep growing it, I can build teams and they can go cut, you know, multiple lawns, whatever. So my point is, is that the ones that I'm a fan of are the ones that have potential to actually become actual businesses as opposed to just the hamster wheel of side gigs. It's almost like an independent consultant or even a YouTuber, right? You know, I make money through making videos. I'm only as good as my last video because the algorithm is going to stop showing my videos if I stop making videos, right? So uh, same thing with independent contractors. My good friend, uh, Sean O'Dowd on Twitter you know, we had this conversation. Um, usually I don't name names, but he knows that uh, we, we talked about this. You know, he's, he does very well for himself independently contracting. But, you know, sometimes you're, you're, you get in a six-month contract, that contract ends. Well, now you got to find another contract, right? So um, you got to find something that has the potential to turn into a business that you can kind of work yourself out of and become the owner as opposed to working in the business, if that makes sense. So you mentioned Twitter, Marco. So now I know it's safe to bring the, bring up the topic I was <laughs> going to talk about. You're like, guys, YouTube's where my philosophy's at. Twitter's just for fun. And you mentioned dividends earlier. And I saw you taking down a dividend bro the other day. It's just like the crypto bros. The guys were just so gung ho about dividends. They think that dividends are the bee's knees, and that they, you know, no company can ever go bankrupt. But I think the the basically the gist of the conversation was one guy was like, in five years, this this company's going to be paying. Uh, <laughs> 50, 57% dividend yield. Like if you're stupid, if you don't just put all of your money into this, but you also mentioned that you do invest in dividends. So um, yes. I, I just love to get your, your balanced dividend approach. Cause I think most of the time when Justin and I do talk to folks in here there, it's the VTIs, it's the VTSIX. It's just getting all this stuff via like capital gains, not getting the dividends paid out every quarter or every, however often the dividend comes. Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, I'm not out to like get anyone. Like I don't see, I don't, I don't like social, I don't like social media because it radicalizes people. You have to be like black, white, you know, there's no nuance, right? It's just like, you have to say like, 
uh, you know, you go down the Andrew Tate route, like, you know, if your wife isn't cooking three hot meals for you a day, you know, kick her to the curb, you know, it's like, it's ridiculous, dude. <laughs> so my, my point is, is that, so the, the gentleman or, or lady, I don't even know, it's an anonymous account, which I can't True. stand. Like you're anonymous, <laughs> like, okay. Like there's no repercussions to what you're saying. You can say whatever you want. Uh, my point is, is that that person kind of insinuated not insinuated, they made a direct statement saying, hey, you know, uh, I invest in SCHD, you know, because it's going to do X, your income or your, uh, what was it? Basically, it snowballs, your income is going to be huge in five years, right? It's the gist of it. Um, I'm just like, dude, how can you say this? Like, do you have a time machine? Like, do you have a crystal ball? So the problem is with social media is that um, a lot of people make definitive statements. And you also have to realize not only are some of these accounts anonymous, they're also from people that um, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't even consider myself a subject matter expert. I don't manage people's money and 99.9% .9 of people on Twitter don't either. Um, but unless you're like Bill Ackman or one of these hedge funds guys that goes on Twitter, but like there are people that come off as a subject matter expert, but really aren't, if that makes sense. There's a lot of charlatans, a lot of snake oil salesmen, a lot of grifters on social media for sure especially depending on the space that you're in. Um, but what I'm trying to say is my biggest holding is VTI. So I find, I find a balanced approach. I have a significant portion of my equities portfolio in VTI. I have a significant portion of it in SCHD. I have uh, dividend stocks. I have a dividend portfolio. Uh, somewhere it's like 50-50. And the tax advantage accounts is more dividends. And the taxable, it's VTI. So I can, if I want, I can borrow against it. I can do whatever I want against it, Right. Uh, I can sell uh, covered calls. I can do um, cash secured puts. I can do a bunch of different you know, strategies in a taxable account. So my point is, is that I'm more of a, I'm probably the most balanced person <laughs> that I know on social media because I just try and call out stuff that's ridiculous, right? These are ridiculous statements. And that's not my identity on social media. I don't care. But I just feel like a lot of people are disingenuous. Here's the other thing that bugs me about dividend Twitter. Um, it's these people will say, Hey, 30 years from now, this is going to snowball and your income is going to be 90 grand a year. Dude, a Toyota Corolla is going to cost uh, 60 grand in 30 years from now. Like they're, <laughs> they're disingenuous. What is your purchasing power? That's what no one talks about. Inflation is the biggest stealth tax there is. Inflation is eating people's portfolios and their purchasing power alive. And no one talks about that. Now with dividends, if you're at dividend growth investing, the share price has to meet or exceed inflation, the rate of inflation. So inflation is 5% and your dividend is 5% or excuse me, your uh, dividend growth is 5%. You're fine. You're at a wash. But if you're saying, uh, if your share price is getting decimated, but your stream of income is 90 grand, it's not even kept up with inflation. That's a losing proposition. So I think as long as people just clarify it a little bit more before making these huge sweeping statements. And then the, the second tweet to follow up is always, Hey, join my newsletter, buy my course, do this. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. well, no, no shit, dude. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I can do that too. You know, I can do an only fans in my sauna, you know, and teach finance <laughs> and make 30 grand a month, but I'm not going to, you know what I mean? <laughs> so my issue is not with um, calling people out. It's just, um, there's a lot of disingenuous people, um, on social media and I'd rather take the nuanced natural or excuse me, neutral approach than make these unbelievable, you know, statements. So that's, that's, that's it. That's all that bothers me. And I think people like they misinterpret what I'm saying. And I'll say the, um, the stuff that gets into my pers uh, into my Twitter feed from personal finance, some of it is the dumbest shit ever. It's like, <laughs> if you have one rental property and it makes you 200 a month, and you have two rental properties, it'll make you 400 a month. And it's like, oh, wow, dude, you know how to multiply by two. It's like, are you fucking kidding me, dude? Like, I don't know. Some of it's just really bad. So I don't know. But I don't know how to go viral on Twitter. That's not my expertise. I think I'm too, too, um, uh, how do I say it? I'm too human. Like, I'm not branded. I just type and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Neanderthal. I'm a monkey, right? Like, okay, <laughs> I've lived through all this. I know what I'm talking about, but I just don't do it in a uh, bow tied you know, packaged way. So maybe I can work on that. Maybe I don't care. <laughs> One thing me and Cody love to do is like, you know, find these articles that are like, you know, these are the three things that you must do. These rules of thumb that are very <laughs> terrible and just like break down why they're wrong. And so as such a consumer of YouTube, are there any kind of PSAs that you would love to give the audience, even though I feel like we have a pretty, um, you know, a pretty smart audience, but things that they may be seeing on YouTube or Twitter, uh, besides like the one example you just gave that are, risky propositions that people really need to watch out for, not, you know, not follow those snake oil salesmen. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think here here's a yellow flag in my opinion. If uh, if a creator that you watch is one day a a credit card expert, then a Bitcoin expert, and a crypto expert, then a, a land flipping expert, then an FBA expert. You know, to me, that's unless they've genuinely done those things and documented it, that's fine. But I'm saying if they haven't, then that could be someone who's just kind of an opportunist, right? Trying to ride the algorithm on different trends. Um, I think that if you find someone that's documented their journey online, um, those people are credible and trustworthy. If you find someone that's kind of jumping into spaces just to, and they conveniently come out with a new course for that subject, that could be an opportunist. But I think uh, to, your, to your question, Justin, I think um, following trends uh, in anything, it could be, you know, crypto, it could be stocks, could be, you know, some cert- some way to invest, portfolio construction, whatever. Um, I think that you should follow people that have kind of been doing what they preach and showing results, um, you know, full transparency. So I, sh- I, you know, I share my account. I have no problem doing that. I share my dividend portfolio every week. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm like uh, some angel or a good guy. All I'm saying is that I'm just a regular dude that's followed what I've preached. Um, if someone has some unbelievable trading strategy and it works for them and they're honest, you know, go follow that if you want. But I think it boils down to you kind of, you know, just vibes, aura, you know, that kind of a thing. You know who's a grifter and who isn't. But um, what I would say is I think that um, I think YouTube is an unbelievable educational tool. Um, just don't get caught up in like views, portfolio amount or subscriber base. So I know this, this sounds kind of weird, but hear me out here. I think people that are new or beginners, they see person, person has big portfolio, you know, they must be a genius, right? Well, that, that very well could be, but I think that you need to watch someone long enough to really know if they know what they're talking about. Um, and I think like subscriber counts and things like that, especially with shorts, reels, you know, uh, TikToks, all that you know, someone can go from zero to a million subscribers in a month now, um, if those things go viral. Um, so I would, um, just be careful with that. Like those are vanity metrics in my opinion. I think it boils down to find a style that works for you. Don't jump around, you know, every week, you know, stick with something, whether it's value investing, whether it's a Boglehead three fund portfolio where you just have international VTI and BND. Um, you could be the all weather portfolio. It could be a million different things. I would just say in a long-winded way, follow someone for a little bit, see if they know what they're talking about, and then you can try and recreate that yourself. Speaking of what you were just talking about with the creators who blow up, they have a million followers, and they're that TikTok influencer, like personal finance advice video that you did, Mark, was hilarious. <laughs> oh, thank you. Such bad takes. Go check that out, listeners, if, you, if you're interested in some horrible takes on TikTok, one of the worst money advice ever. And yeah. you just pick them apart. Well, I, I try. <laughs> thank you. I try to at least educate after each one. I'm not just there like, you know, laughing just at laughing, people. Just laughing, yeah. Yeah, because I my channel is probably more educational than anything. Probably 80% education, 20% maybe entertainment or dad jokes or whatever. But um, no, I appreciate that, man. Sometimes you just have to like, call some of the stuff out. But again, I don't want to be that guy. Like I'm not like, you know, finance Karen or in some position to, to do that. It's just some stuff is just blatantly wrong. And like, I'm, I guess I come, I, my delivery is wrong. My delivery is probably overly aggressive when it should be just, I'm looking out for the dude that's brand new that just doesn't know what he doesn't know. You know, that is completely fair. And talking about the long form content versus short form, I think that's Maybe one of your gripes with these platforms is like Twitter or Instagram Reels or TikTok. It's like, it's so short that sometimes you can't get into the nuance. Like it's just impossible to get through all of the bullet points and the and ifs and the if thens. And, but one of the things that you talk about, and this is probably a very good for long form is like kind of the U S as a whole and like the debt and the government. And I know you just talked about like inflation and purchasing power. I know we have a couple of minutes left here, but and you have a really good, a really good couple of videos on this, but could we just talk about that at like a really high level? And again, this is like more of a podcast conversation or a YouTube thing. It would probably wouldn't come across very well. You could make some outlandish statement in a tweet, but you wouldn't be able to hit all the nuances. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of the issue I have with short form content and tweets. I think, I think people take, um, there's no, there's no inflection in text. So I could say like, Hey Cody, your your hair looks nice. Or I could say, Hey Cody, your hair looks nice. You know, there's a bunch of different ways to say the same thing, right? Um, so I think that's kind of an issue to begin with. And then the short form content, there's no way you have enough nuance to actually understand what's going on. So you kind of have to make it very sensationalist. And that's kind of back, black, blah, back to my point about black and white. That's actually a lot harder to say. Back to my point about black and white. Um, it's kind of like, well, there's gray areas. I mean, there's nuance to everything, right? You can't just. It's like the news. You can't just read a headline and that's 100% true, right? 
So uh, to answer your question, if uh, in regards to inflation, I had a video about three years ago called Savers or Losers. So people don't like, unless they've been watching me for a while or unless they don't watch the whole video, they don't understand what I mean when I say that. So savers are not losers. My parents are immigrants. I'm a saver. My parents are savers. My wife's parents are savers. We're savers naturally. And again, this is why I'm a big Bitcoiner, which I may wrap this all together at the end. But um, you have to realize we live in an inflationary fiat system. So there's nothing that backs our money except maybe the military, international demand for dollars, uh, the petrodollar, uh, oil is traded in dollars, demand for the U.S. dollar. That's why our currency hasn't hyperinflated. So we, the Federal Reserve sets what's called a well, – actually, this is going to go way down a big rabbit hole. Let me just say the Federal Reserve sets interest rates. They lend it to commercial banks at that interest rate. Commercial banks lend it to us at a higher rate. That's called the Fed funds rate. So if they get it at 1%, they'll give it to Cody at 2% for a house. They'll give it to Justin at 5% for a car. Just pretend. So my point is uh, we've been raising uh, rates uh, pretty actually in the fastest we've uh, raised them in the last 40 years or so um, to combat inflation. So why is inflation important? Inflation is important because if your wage is, um, let's just say for easy numbers, $100,000, and a banana in year zero goes from one dollar, and next year it's a dollar twenty, and that uh, your money is being saved in a bank at let's say zero percent, just for an easy example. Well, you just lost twenty percent of your purchasing power. You didn't get a raise at work. Your money isn't earning for you in the bank. The banana went from a dollar to a dollar twenty. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So your your purchasing power is being eroded completely. So if your investments or your money is not at least at the rate of inflation, you are losing money. So you're a saver. I'm saving. I'm doing a good job. I'm a responsible adult, citizen, human being, but I'm a loser. I'm losing money. I'm losing purchasing power. Excuse me, not money. I'm losing purchasing power to inflation. Um, so that's that's it in a nutshell. And that's why inflation is a stealth tax that many people, they don't really comprehend because they don't see it coming out of their bank account. They, they know they're on this hamster wheel. They know that, hey, I'm not getting ahead in life. You know, I'm, you know, I, there's, there's some reason why my family tree stays where it is, whether it's lower class, middle class, upper class, whatever, you know, I haven't really shifted socioeconomic status. Why is that? Well, it's because inflation kind of keeps you where you are and it lowers the living standard for everyone. If you're not beating that inflation is what I mean. And a lot of times with a, you know, any kind of economic challenge comes an opportunity. Do you see anything there where, okay, we in this inflationary environment, this is a tactic that you would recommend people at least consider and, and educate themselves on. Yeah. So what's big now? Um, so I found I follow this guy on Twitter. He's called a uh, family office guy. So family offices, for those that don't know, are just literally offices designed to manage a family's finances because they have so much money. So instead of giving it to a financial advisor or you know managing it themselves, they literally have dedicated. Uh, an office to manage their wealth. So I follow family office guy on Twitter and I feel like everyone's a guy now on Twitter. You have home services guy, you have C <laughs> CEO guy, you have strip mall guy. Dividend guy. Yeah, dividend <laughs> guy, yeah. Um, so I follow him and he posted a pretty interesting chart and I just got back from a huge wealth management conference in uh, Scottsdale. Um, so it's funny because these two things align. They're completely unrelated. So the um, the family office guy on Twitter, he posted how family offices are allocating their funds, right? Specific, not specifically to combat inflation, but it's a big part of why they're doing what they're doing. And in the first infographic, I wish I could pull this up, but for the sake of the podcast, I'm just going to kind of shoot from the hip. But basically, it was like 30%, 40% equities. And then it was kind of like, you know, real estate. And then you have like alternative investments making up maybe like 15, 20%. And there's a breakdown of what those alternative investments are. This could be royalties. It could be you know, a bunch of different things, right? Um, and, and that was in 2021, I believe. And then the next year, or it was either 2022 or 2023, I can't remember. Alternatives were now 40%. Equities went down by like 10, 15%. So from like 40 to like, I don't know, 25, 28, right around there. And alternatives made up a much bigger chunk. So typically what people do in inflationary environments is um, they look at things like commodities, they look at oil, they look at real estate, uh, they look at precious metals. They look at alternative investments that you wouldn't typically think of. Um, and then the the wealth conference that I was at, 
uh, the gentleman gave a presentation. This was a conference for financial advisors. Um, so they have, everyone was there, Goldman Sachs, Wisdom Tree, um, you, know, you name it, Putnam, everyone was there. So this guy gives a, um, a presentation about how alternative investments are actually smoothing out portfolios um, during these types of environments, whether it's recessionary or whether it's inflationary. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. So, um, but actually real estate is also considered an alternative investment as well. So I don't know if that was part of it because I know they broke out like REITs and uh, things like that, real estate investment trusts. But uh, in the first guy's presentation, it made up a big chunk of family office uh, allocation. Yeah, I mean, real estate makes intuitive sense to me. Like you mentioned earlier, depending on where you live in the country, like you're probably getting appreciation, but then you're getting cash flow in the Midwest, on the coast, you're getting more like chance for an equity gain and, you know, rents go up as inflation starts to rise. So one thing I do want to ask, one thing I want to touch on before we round this thing out, Marco, I know you mentioned you might come full circle and talk about how Bitcoin might <laughs> be like something helpful. And Justin and I definitely aren't be like, put all your money in Bitcoin. I know you're not like that either, no. but I, I just want to kind of hear the argument for why that's the case and how Bitcoin could be something that's like a, a really good hedge against inflation and how it might kind of solve some of the fiat problems we're seeing. Yeah. So, um, I'll, I'll just give your audience three books. Like I, I'm not affiliated with these people. I know them personally, but I'm not, you know, compensated for this at all. I, I say this on Twitter all the time. So a lot of people, they don't really understand Bitcoin and that's fine. Like no one should, excuse me, sorry, I'm chugging water here. Um, no one needs to be a Bitcoin scholar or an equities analyst or anything. Like I'm a big proponent of like, hey, my money's being inflated away. My life work is being inflated away if I don't put my money in randomly in the market or real estate. I have to be an investor and a human being and a citizen, member of society. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's asking too much of people. Why should the little old lady down the street need to know how to invest um, just because her money's being inflated away, right? She needs to invest to be able to maintain purchasing power. Why is that? So that's why I'm a big proponent of Bitcoin. Um, so just all you have to do is read these three books to understand kind of like where I'm coming from. Um, I've done obviously more research than these three, but these three will give you a big... Um, big base or big foundation of knowledge. So, and reading them in this order, it's the bullish case for Bitcoin, that's Vijay Boyapati. Um, the bullish case for Bitcoin will give you a good primer as to why it's a good bet going into the future. Um, number two is Inventing Bitcoin, that's Jan Pritzker, Inventing Bitcoin. And those two are free. One is an article, uh, the second is an article, you can download for free, it's a PDF. And the third one is uh, the Bitcoin Standard, that's a book. So the first one is the bullish case for Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the hardest form of money ever created. So fiat money is soft money. It's not backed by anything other than things that we talked about, military, international demand for dollars, and oil, right? Uh, it's much more complicated than that, but for the sake of a podcast, dollars are just whatever. Um, the other thing is Bitcoin is completely uh, decentralized. No one controls it. It is proof of work versus proof of stake. So when you have proof of stake, this is just saying, hey, I'm a rich guy, I have a lot of money, you know, I should make money from my money, it's usury, right? It's, it's interest, making money off rent-seeking behavior, that's proof of stake. Proof of work is like being a farmer, okay? You have to verify all these transactions in the blockchain through electricity, through thermodynamics, which means that you are expending energy, time, you know, uh, money, all that stuff to be able to do so. Um, that way the transactions get verified and you get rewarded in Bitcoin for verifying these blocks. So uh, without getting super complicated, it's no different than a farmer tending to his field, right? He expends energy. It's no different than a gold miner expending crews, human energy, mechanical energy, fuel to get to the gold, right? So um, Inventing Bitcoin, the second book, does a good job of the technical side of Bitcoin for the layman, the lay people like me, you, people that are non-technical, right? Um, we're not coders, developers. It helps us understand why it makes sense. Um, and then also it's, it's fixed. There's only 21 million ever. It's programmed into the code. It can never be changed. Um, and then also it goes through a halving event. So every four years or 210,000 blocks, blocks of information, transactions that are verified, the reward for the miners get cut in half. So it went from 50 to 25 to 12 and a half to six point whatever. And then in uh, April of 2024, coming up here in about a year, it's going to get cut in half again. Um, why is that important? Because it's becoming not only naturally, organically more scarce, its monetary policy is baked in for the next hundred years. We don't know what the Fed is doing next week. We don't know if they're raising <laughs> interest rates, lowering interest rates. 
Bitcoin's monetary policy is baked in for 100 years and there's a limited supply. There is no, you know, billion dollars to Ukraine. There is no trillions during COVID. There is no, you know, whatever. It's just made up, right? You don't even know where it's going. So it's on a public ledger. It's verifiable. It's trustless. What does that mean? I, I don't need to trust Cody or Justin. I just need to know that he sends me the money at my address. It's either here or it isn't, right? So it's trustless and it's all verified through the miners. So if, you're, if your audience isn't familiar with Bitcoin, this is probably just a big word salad and I sound like a psychopath. But I'm telling you, take, take literally a week of your life and read those three books. It doesn't take long. You can read the first two in, in a week, if that. Uh, so inventing or the bullish case for Bitcoin, inventing Bitcoin, and uh, the Bitcoin standard. And there's many more books, but those are the good primer. <clears throat> Did that awesome make any work sense work. whatsoever? <laughs> I'm also starving too, so I may have uh, not made sense there. No, it did make sense. And we've had guests on before that, uh, you know, kind of, we took a little bit more time and broke down crypto in general. So I think the audience is primed up a little bit for it. And, you know, like you said, you gave the resources, people go out there, check those out and they'll be educated. But um, just wanted to say, Marco, thank you so much for giving us some time coming on the show. Uh, it's clear that you've got a, a lot of great things that you're educating people on based on, you know, the, the following that you've uh, grown on YouTube. Um, it'll be fun watching, you know, maybe the next uh, interactions you have on Twitter, uh, but always <laughs> looking forward to the great takes that you have and the education you're spreading out to the broader audience. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, I don't know how I come off on Twitter. I really don't care. But my, my point is I'm not one of these people building a brand, which is probably a bad thing and maybe a good thing at the same time. But um, I, I appreciate it. And I've, I just, I come from the uh, perspective of, I just want to help 99% of people that don't have these personal financial literacy conversations at the dinner table, um, because I think it's important. I think it sets yourself up for the next leap of, it's not even status. That's the wrong word. I don't care about status. It's about getting out of something that you don't want to do and giving you options through wealth accumulation. Like dollars are just freedom units in my opinion it just gives you options that's it love that and is it whiteboard finance everywhere twitter youtube website all that good stuff yeah uh youtube is whiteboard finance instagram is whiteboard finance twitter is whiteboard fin f-i-n um and then everything else is pretty much whiteboard finance awesome i appreciate you man and thank you for coming on yeah my pleasure thanks for having me all right 